Hey everyone, just a quick content warning at the top. This episode contains discussion in and around the subject of domestic abuse and trans people. At 53 minutes in, there will be talk around the policies of domestic abuse shelters in regards to trans people. And at 1 hour and 5 minutes, the discussion moves to talking about specific forms of abuse itself. There will be more warnings coming up as the show goes on, but please do take this under advisement. Now, on with the show. The category is... What the trans darling? Hello, everyone. Welcome to What the Trans. What the Trans? What the Trans, indeed. Ashley, what's going on? How's Manchester? Uh, surprisingly sunny today, actually. It was not what I was expecting. It's all been a bit crazy on the weather front, ever so tropical. Like, you basically need to carry around an umbrella, uh, a raincoat, and some sunglasses and some shorts to change into because we're just getting several weeks' worth of weather all in one day. It's, it's interesting. But the big work thing, MIF, is over, and I am more or less recovered from it. But, uh, yes, so on on to the next thing. How are you? I'm all right. I can't give you an update on the weather because I haven't actually left the house today. Rock and roll. Yeah, I, I have nothing exciting to report. Except, <laughs> that, yeah, except that, actually, I do. I do, because I have a job. You do? After so long of not having a job because I've been uh, off sick for a very long time, I'm returning to the world of work, admittedly for one or two days a week. But as a star, I'm going to be editing shows at the Rusty Quill. So, I mean, it feels like I have to plug them now. The Rusty Quill do a whole bunch of podcasts about, like, uh, nerdy fantasy stuff. They've got a gaming show where a bunch of people play d d or It's not d d it's something else, but you get the idea. I'm going to be chopping up their episodes. So go and subscribe to all of them, because you won't hear my voice, but you will be able to hear my work without Excellent. hearing me screaming at Audacity at three in the morning. Which is I mean, going we, to happen. We tend not to hear that on the show anyway. Thankfully, those bits are edited out. But, yes, um, check that stuff out. I should collect those for some kind of special. Just the Michelle shouting at a computer show. So we could make that into some kind of noise album. So if you're interested in making an artistic <laughs> noise album, then do get in touch at What The Trans. So, yes, and what a fun couple of weeks it has been in the news. We need to introduce uh, Diana. We absolutely do. <laughs> I was co- I was coming on to that. Jesus. Oh, I'm I sorry. Have... I thought you were going to start doing the news, Dan. I'm just like, wait, we've no. got a third person here. We have format points. I was going to stick to them. I apologise. Um, Continue. It, let's pretend right. that never so th- happened. So there's been a lot of news in the last couple of weeks. And so to help us pick through it, you see, that's how you do it. Um, We have a splendid guest alongside us uh, for this episode, who is Diana James. Good evening. Welcome to the show. (laughs) Hello. I'm not sure if I wanted to say anything else or not. (laughs) I think we need to work out a plan with our guests on how we introduce them at some point. That's a tie on us, Diana. That's all right. (laughs) How's it going, Diana? Absolutely fine, thank you very much. Only the thing is that Plymouth Pride for this weekend has been cancelled due to the bad weather. Ah, well, now I feel bad for talking about the reasonably acceptable weather up north. No, because Boardmasters down here uh, has also been cancelled, which I was going to be at as well. Oh, so I someone mentioned that at work today. It's like, oh, have you heard Boardmasters have been has been cancelled? I mean, so okay, a couple of questions: What's Boardmasters and why has it been cancelled? Um, but it seems to be a thing that people have heard of. New one on me, I'm afraid. Um, but yes, I learned today what Boardmasters is and that it has been cancelled. So that kind of sucks. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, because we were going to have like a safe area for people that had been sexually assaulted or had any kind Mm. of hate crime or whatever. So we were going to go around in super T-shirts and then they could accost us and we could take them to a safe place and help them get through Mm -hmm. their stuff. Um, That's a damn shame. I had no idea this was happening. I mean, again, I I haven't... (laughs) I don't don't know what happens outside of London. I'm one of those (laughs) people who, you know... Yes. Believes that the country ends at the M25 now. And I hated those people years ago, but I am one now. I apologise to everyone outside the <laughs> M25. I am I am the worst. It is, it is fair to say I am the worst. So, Diana, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do? Oh, gosh. I know that's a big question. Um, Diana has been on the show before. I talked to her at London Pride. And, yeah, Diana does a lot. So just try and give us, like, uh, the brief cliff notes on what you do. Uh, I've... Work in domestic abuse. I also work with hate crime. I tend to work quite a bit with the criminal justice system, mostly um, as an independent advisor, which used to be called a critical friend. But I think they took the critical out and just want us to be friends. 
but I'm not that friendly. Mm. So you are a professional critic? <laughs> a friend. <laughs> Sorry, not critic, friend. You're a professional friend. No, they got a th- Sometimes it can be both. Well, it's good to have you on because we're going to be covering a lot of stuff which is sort of, either sort of or actually in your area. Mm-hmm. Like We're going to be talking about the Equality Act later on and we're going to be talking mm. about um, domestic abuse yeah. and how that relates to trans and non-binary people. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of things. But first, should we start with some news, Ashley? That sounds like a splendid idea. Should we do some good news or terrible news? I think... I think due to the um, previously agreed format of the show, I think we should do some terrible news. So won't that be fun? It's it's a bumper edition this time, isn't it? So let's so let's get into it. Yeah, it's not a particularly good time for the news. It's not it's not a very very good selection of stories, but they are all important for very different reasons. And let's so let's get this through this together. So I encourage you, listener at home, to go gather some loved ones and snuggle up under a duvet and listen to this show and share a box of tissues, and a Terry's chocolate orange. We're not sponsored. I just had one of those recently, and they're delicious, so, you know, give they it a are. go. Anyway, let's do some anyway. actual terrible fucking news. Hmm. And what's first, my darling? First, Ipso, who we've been talking about a lot. Yes, indeed. Uh, Ipso, the independent press standards organisation, has appointed Edward Fox QC as their new chairman. For those who do not know, Ipso is as close as the UK has to a press regulatory body, who we have been very critical of, for their complete lack of action when it comes to maintaining journalistic standards, as well as bashing down transphobic garbage in the media when it happens, which is happening a lot in the UK media right now. Our UK Mm -hmm. listeners will be very familiar with the hostility thrown at them by the UK media. And to listeners elsewhere, just go to the Times website and search the term transgender. And you too can ruin your day just like the Brits. This new chairman will be Edward Fox QC, a Conservative member of the House of Lords and former Justice Minister from 2013 to 2016 under David Cameron's Conservative government. It has been reported in the Press Gazette that Lord Fox, because the UK still has Lords like it's Downton Abbey or some shit, that Lord Fox no longer takes the Conservative whip and is classed as an independent peer in the House of Lords, not tied to any party. But when it comes to his voting record, it should be noted that his he has remained totally loyal to the Conservative Party over 99% of the time. Literally over 99% of the time. Check the references sheet. There is a link in there where you can see for yourself. This isn't hyperbole. Literally over 99% of the time, which for an independent lord is peculiar. But anyway, he will start his new role on the 1st of January next year. It should also be noted here that Ipso claims to be totally independent. <laughs> Sorry, no, carry on. Yep. He was appointed by Ipso's appointment panel, which includes Lloyd Embley, a group editor-in-chief of Reach PLC, who publishes the Daily Mirror, Daily Express, Daily Star, and dozens of other national region news- regional newspapers in the UK. Also on the panel, Adrian Jenkins, chair of the National Landlords Association, so, you know, he's a good one, and chair of the News Media Association, who on their About Us page on their website says the NMA exists to promote the interests of news media publishers to government, regulatory bodies, industry bodies, and other organisations whose work affects the industry. Which is basically lobby speak for they're a lobby, right? They're a news lobbying group. Mm. That's what they are, right? Yes, uh, that's that's kind of what it sounds like to me, um, you know, in management bastardese. Anyway, again, Ipso, totally independent. Totally independent. According to The Press Gazette, which was one of only three places that covered the appointment, Times editor John Witherow also advised on Lord Falk's appointment. That is the same Times newspaper which is currently being sued by a former trans employee for transphobic discrimination. The former employee, Catherine O'Donnell, claims that one of the factors in her dismissal may have been her gaining a difficult reputation after she protested the extensively transphobic coverage in The Times. This is also the same Times newspaper who, as we covered in our last episode, featured heavily in the recent Hacked Off report on transphobia in the press. The report provided 24 examples of articles and news stories that included varying levels of transphobia, as well as factual inaccuracies and misleading claims, of which just under half of the examples came from The Times. Again, Ipso, totally independent, absolutely independent, totally. According to Mm -hmm. Ipso, the chair is a part-time role, which, among other things, heads up the Complaints Committee, who, according to Ipso's website, judges complaints relating to potential breaches of the editor's code and decides on what 
a newspaper or magazine should do if the code has been breached, including whether or not to find that publication of a correction or critical ruling is needed to remedy a breach of the code and where this should appear. Totally independent, Ipso. Totally independent. Mm -hmm. We reached out to Ipso for comment and they told us that the appointments panel is completely separate to and has no involvement in Ipso's regulatory work. Their only role is to appoint Ipso's chairman and board and the independent members of the Editor's Code of Practice Committee. So that means that they're appointing the people that decide the things that they get to complain about, right? That's what that is. Yes. So that does sound like it does have a certain level of involvement in the regulatory work in that the people that that panel appoints are going to then go on and do this alleged regulatory work that Ipso claims to do. Um, so... Totally independent. Completely. Mm -hmm. In response to us asking if they were concerned about the message being sent to the transgender community, considering the fact that major powers in the press, including some highlighted in the Hacked Off report, had input in appointing a conservative peer as Ipso's chairperson, they responded with... We've shown a continued commitment to supporting those who have concerns about reporting in this area through our complaints process and other services, guidance, engagement, and through our forthcoming research. They're referring to a, a study that they are currently doing on transphobia in the press. Our role is to protect the public and we want to continue to work with the transgender community to do this. They also said that they believe it is, it is important that Ipso benefits from the skills and experience of the industry we're regulating alongside those that are independent of it. I mean, that's one way to put it. Mm. We also reached out to Hacked Off, a group who campaigns for stronger and more ethical press regulation, and they told us that Ipso's constitution is riddled with pro-industry biases and it has failed the public at every turn. The appointment of an ex-government politician as chairperson of the body who will join the network of politicians and newspaper executives already pulling the strings at the Ipso system demonstrates Ipso's deep, intentional, and developing links to both the industry and the state. Its attempts to spin itself as independent have been exposed once and for all with this appointment, and Ipso should come clean with the public. This is an organization acting exclusively in the interest of the industry. Please check the link in the description to our references page where you can find the full statements from both Ipso and Hacked Off as well as important information on how Ipso is set up and other background information. So where to start, ladies? Independent. Totally independent. Mm -hmm. and yeah, independent. Absolutely. It, it's just... And they seem to be genuinely confused when people say, well, you're not independent. And I thought, well... You this this is why it's stuff like this that is why when it's like you're literally taking advice from someone an editor of a newspaper which is currently involved in a legal process uh, to determine whether it has or hasn't engaged in overt transphobic discrimination. So then to have that person advising on the appointment of an allegedly independent regulatory body is going to raise alarm bells in kind of any circumstance. So, but this is the thing that happens. And again, I'm going to blame capitalism because, you know, it's a day with, an, with a Y in the name. <laughs> but we see this in other industries as well. So in pharmaceutical industry, it's kind of long been known uh, and suggested and discovered in court cases that have been all sorts of shady and unethical practices in there. And one of them is... Uh, and one of the major concerns that a lot of people have about that industry is around this kind of revolving door between people who work for the regulators and people who are quite highly placed in the industry that it claims to be regulating. So you go work and in the industry at a drug company for however many years, then you work at the regulator for a bit, and you kind of, you know, so it's just with this merry-go-round essentially from kind of working in industry and then back at the regulator and so on that doesn't serve anybody's interests apart from the industry itself because then the regulator is not motivated by regulating as it should it's motivated by well let's let's preserve all of our jobs with the minimum of human rights violations because those are expensive for us essentially what do you think about all of this diana does it seem it's not independent at all is it it's um one bloke slapping the back of another i mean to say so is he going to get a job somewhere else after he leaves this i wonder whether that'll be in the newspaper or not i mean indeed and that's 
something to sort of pay attention to. I mean, so he, as a conservative peer, I assume there's an income from that as well. It continues to give the impression of it very mm. much being an old boys club and old boys it's significant there, I think. I think the big thing, the big takeaway from this is the statement where they say that the appointments body appoints the people that decide what the the code of practices, but it is entirely separate from the regulatory work, which is based on that fucking code of practice. So I don't, I don't understand this. Like how, how can they claim to be independent? <laughs> You're setting the questions for your own exam. Yeah, essentially. And it's like, well, you know, sort of set the questions and then go in and answer those questions and easily parry them because you know exactly what's coming. And is going to be asked any pretense that I think hacked off are absolutely right when it says that any pretense of independence that Ipso claimed to have is genuinely being exposed as a sham by this. Because obviously there's not just the issue of transphobia behind some of the things that Ipso has said and done, or more accurately, not said and not done. You know, that's far from the only issue here. And the fact that they have got a, an allegedly independent peer who is actually just seemingly a dyed-in-the-wool conservative to, again, act on this allegedly independent regulatory body is not good news. And that doesn't just apply to the trans community, I feel, given the UK press's propensity to victimise all sorts of people, vulnerable groups, um, people who are different from us, different from you, different from good, hard working taxpayers, essentially. I think the message to take from this is that the trans community are probably not going to be covered by Ipso anytime soon, because right now, at the very least, uh, being transphobic in the press appears to be very profitable. And if the people mm. that profit from that are in the fold at Ipso, then I don't think it's likely that they are going to be stepping in anytime soon. Not while we're all so comfortably riding a gravy train. Um, so there is, it's worth pointing out that we have included in the description a link to um, a petition calling for a public inquiry into this. And, you know, again, it's not just motivated by the stuff that's been done and said around uh, coverage of the trans community. There are lots of kind of UK press problems which Ipso are failing to do anything about and this is sending up alarm bells for all sorts of communities. So there is a petition to sign whether that will be so much as considered or debated or tabled or them paying atten any attention to it whatsoever remains to be seen but at this point it is worth a try. Yeah, it's a, it's a UK government petition. Basically, they have to issue a response if they get 10,000 signatures, and they have to debate it in Parliament if it gets over 100,000. Now, debating in Parliament doesn't mean that they're going to sit down in the House of Commons and talk about it. It means that it will be talked about in a small room, probably off to the side. So you might mistake this for being completely worthless, but that's the thing. These things have had some kind of effect before, if it's for no other mm. reason than to get the issue out into the wider public consciousness. So... Do sign it. Do get your friends to sign it. Because, you know, maybe something will come from it. Should we just... Can we move on? Because I'm sick of it, so... It feels like that's all I'm talking about lately. Yeah. But fuck me, they're bad. They're just so yeah. bad at their job. And the media here is a nightmare. Oh, God, Ashley, please give us some good news. So next in Craven Nepotism, Andrew Gilligan, who we will all know and love as the chief transphobic shit goblin for the Times in the Sunday Times, has joined Boris Johnson's team at 10 Downing Street as a transport advisor. So many things wrong with that. But this does mean, first of all, headline news, this means that he's very, very likely to be giving up his position at the Times. So that's maybe a good thing. Yay! Woo! Yes, little flags, and there was much rejoicing. But um, bear in mind, this is not the first time that Gilligan's worked under Johnson because he served as cycling commissioner of London back when Johnson was the mayor. But from our research over the last few years, Gilligan has been all about two subjects, which is bicycles and bashing trans people. So fingers crossed, this means we won't actually be hearing from him very much for the duration of his tenure, which will probably consist of Gilligan running around Downing Street shouting about bicycles. As a transport advisor, this does suggest that his role will only be transport related and it would be unlikely that he will be called in to advise on any trans related issues, unless there's a transportation component, which could happen? 
I don't know. So we, of course, reached out to Downing Street for some clarification on precisely what Andrew Gilligan's role will be, and they told us that they do not usually comment on advisor appointments, which is one of many, many things that the Downing Street press office will tell you that they don't comment <laughs> on. So um, what are our thoughts? I don't suppose they told him to get on his bike. Wait. I'm sorry, it oh, was lying there and someone needed good. to say it. I, I, I know, I, I can't believe that that one didn't even occur to me. <laughs> I feel so ashamed. Okay, so there's two components to this. One's kind of good and one of them is kind of bad, which is, so he's probably not going to be at the Times anymore. Great. That's a good thing, but he's going to be working in the government for Boris Johnson, who, let's remember, is still the Prime Minister. Um, He is? I know. Which, to me, comes off as an objectively bad thing, (laughs) and again, not just for the trans community. I genuinely would love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, from what I can gather, the chances of him actively being involved in anything transgender-related is going to be remote. And also, I don't believe this is necessarily going to have the effect that some people think it will have, where they're just like, like, oh, there's a transphobe in Downing Street now. Things are going to go terribly wrong. Whereas, yes, hiring a, trans, a transphobe for a high position in government, always bad. But there's several things to consider here. One, he's not a minister. He's an advisor. Mm. He's basically just a voice in the room. And secondly, this isn't likely to result in him having any more influence over Boris Johnson than he would have had already because they've known each other for years. They've worked with each other. Like uh, Gilligan worked Mm. under Boris Johnson when he was the editor of The Spectator. They worked together when uh, Johnson was the mayor of London. You know, they have been close for years. So... I don't think this is necessarily going to make things any worse. And it does mean there's going to be at least one less voice in the media calling us all names. So I think this is a Mm. win, but obviously I could be terribly wrong. And I have been before, but I think this is going to be all right. Yes. Didn't Mrs. May have two advisors that um, put a little thing in her ear about having an election? Yes. um, I'm not sure that's what Gilligan's going to be suggesting, given the extreme slender majority the Conservative Party currently has in the House of Commons, which is, you know, literally one MP gives them the majority. And that's assuming they can keep the DUP on side. So just for reference for our listeners outside of the UK, the DUP are currently in a, what we call a confidence and supply deal with the Conservative Party. And the DUP are the Democratic Unionist Party from Northern Ireland who are religious fundamentalist bigots and uh, have repeatedly blocked same-sex marriage. Ireland is the only place in the UK where there is still not full and equal access to oh, abortion. Northern Ireland. So at the moment, Northern Ireland, yes, at the moment, as, at time of recording. But obviously, we wait and hope for change. Isn't and change soon. coming in October? Yeah, I talked. To, yeah, this is a situation where they. I can't remember the term of it, but they have effectively announced that abortion and gay marriage could be a thing by October. But I've mm. talked to some friends in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and they've basically said that the chances of this actually happening are almost slim to none because all the DEP had to do to block Mm. that is to write a a petition of concern. A petition of concern. So the petition of concern, just for context, and this is something that makes me so angry, because it's something specifically um, built into the Good Friday Agreement, which is sorting out a lot of problems that there were between the UK's relationship with Northern Ireland and, and, you know, troubles and all of that stuff. The Good Friday Agreement was an extremely key component in all of that stopping, and the petition of concern was intended to be used when there was a danger that, okay, no, you are going too far, there's a danger of sectarian violence, there's a danger of sliding back into armed patrols and blah 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 Um, but that's not what it has been used for, it has been used repeatedly by the DUP simply to block equal marriage in Northern Ireland when it is present in the rest of the United Kingdom. So that's super annoying. But the point is, if the Conservative Party fail to keep the DUP on side, then they will lose the extremely slender majority they already have, and there will have to be an election. Whether this happens before October, who can say? But there was al- there's already been a by-election which has unseated a Conservative and left that majority at just one person. So Gilligan isn't likely to say, let's have an election, unless he very quickly wants to lose his new job. I mean, this is my thinking, but then I feel we've seen extremely overconfident members of the Conservative Party calling snap elections before, uh, which is one of the reasons we got into into this particular flavour of this very specific kind of mess that we're all collectively in. I think the thing to know about the DUP uh, as a headline is I first became aware of them during the uh, equal marriage debate that was happening in Parliament back in 2013. I watched the whole thing 
because that's because I don't do a lot in the day and I fancied a laugh. Seven hours of watching Parliament mm. debate this whole issue. And one of their guys, I don't know who it was, but I remember he said, it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That was his contribution to a parliamentary debate. Yeah. Like, that was what he said. Mm. Well done, Chuck. Really, thank, thank you for your contribution. Sorry, I took you down that rabbit hole now. Oh, it's fine. It may have been interesting for our non-UK-based listeners and, in, you know, probably a bit annoying for the ones who already know about that. But Well, it's always good to remind them that everything's terrible. Yeah. Yeah, because of course the trans community really needs to be regularly reminded of that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, what do you guys out there in the world think of Andrew Gilligan? Like, uh, am I wrong to be, you know, kind of optimistic about this? Let us know on the Twitter at what the trans, and you know, call me all the names under the sun if I am incorrect. Well, I'm, I'm really not sure we should be encouraging people to call us names on Twitter. Because again, there's, there really is enough of that yeah, already. Yeah, but the people that follow us on Twitter are amazing. Like, they are so supportive and nice. Like, I just put up the new logo and it was a roundly, like, lots of lovely messages about that. Love you out there, everyone. You're all lovely. Mm. Yeah, you guys, you guys Especially are Especially cool. one individual uh, young trans guy walking around Philadelphia who I now know listens to the show. This one's for you. Thank you for listening. Yeah. So, yes, that's, sorry, that was a very, very UK-focused story. But this could potentially be a good thing in that Andrew Gilligan is about to not be at the Times anymore. And that that seems objectively okay. So uh, that's some sort of good news with the potential for bad things later on. But let us move on, shall we? Do we have some good news here? Let's see. Gay Star News, a UK-based LGBT news site, has closed its doors after eight years. Okay, we're just going to keep going with the terrible news then. All right, all right, fine. To those outside the UK, Gay Star News was founded by Tris Reed Smith and Scott Nunn back in 2011 and was a mainstay in the UK queer media. They were a news-based website whose reports helped us a lot here on the show when gathering information for stories and was one of our many go-tos for accurate information that would inform our own reporting and investigations. The 20 Strong team were told of the closure three days before payday and it would appear that they did not receive their final wages. There is a crowdfunder that has been set up to help raise money for those affected. Link in the reference sheet in the description. Go give them money if you can and give it a share if you can't. In a final post to the website, Tris Reed Smith cited the uncertainty businesses are facing due to Brexit impacting their businesses, as well as a change in the way businesses engaged with the LGBT community. In the article, Reed Smith explained that there has also been another trend which has become more apparent this year. Brands which are wishing to do LGBTI work are increasingly doing so in a tokenistic way. Rather than working with us to engage and serve LGBTI people year round, many have chosen to rainbow wash. They have turned their logo rainbow colour for Pride Week or month and at best made a small donation to an LGBTI good cause. Worse still, we have learned that some brands have done this whilst at the same time funding anti-LGBTI politicians to the tune of millions of dollars. Tokenism has reached a new low. So we here at the show are going to be very, very sorry that Gay Star News isn't a thing anymore, as they have always maintained a trans-supportive and inclusive editorial line, and was one of only a small bunch of media players out there who backed up the trans community over here in the UK. They will be sorely missed. Ah, Yeah, I know. And, and it's... The, the, again, they're absolutely right, though. This um, I particularly enjoyed the critique of brands uh, pink washing slash rainbow washing their stuff and saying, yeah, look, we support the LGBT community. Um, and Because this is something you and I have spoken about, Michelle, on the podcast at yeah. length. Um, because, you know, it's one of the many, many things that, uh, that we've spoken about on the podcast. But Gay Star News were always extremely supportive and they found and published stories that you not, wouldn't necessarily see in the mainstream press because it was quite specifically an lgbt focused thing they were global they had stories from all over the world so it's it's just sucks that they're gone it's a real blow to like lgbt media in the uk particularly given the current media and political landscape yeah diana did you read them i did yeah i read their twitter stuff and then went in and looked at their site quite often but sadly, I sort of lived through the time when mm. there was newspapers that you would pick up in cafes and stuff like Capital Gay, The Pink Paper, G3 and Lesbian London were printed media. But then they gradually disappeared. Mm. And now we're losing, seems to be, every piece of information, every independent thought. 
Yeah, there's something to that. But it should be said that um, we don't have any operating costs or any backers whatsoever. So the chances of us going under in the same way are almost none. So we may be the last people I know, standing. Right? <laughs> which is awful. Last company to close, please switch off the lights. I mean, it can't just be it can't just be like people like us who like report news for the community because we aren't like trained professionals following you know, court cases and, you know, council mm. decisions and all this other stuff that professional journalists do. Like, if you wanted to be harsh, you would call us hobbyists. I would arguably call ourselves <laughs> DIY journalists, but I know a lot of, like, actually trained journalists would probably kind of rightly look down their nose at us because we need them. We need them to be there because they know what they're doing. Although, obviously, journalists from certain publications, if they look down their nose at us, I'll just break their fucking nose for them. But... This is why I don't get invited to fancy parties. <laughs> oh, Ashley, never change. <laughs> Another wrinkle to this. Um, there was a response from the usual suspects in Turfland. Yes, because of course they there was. They widely seem to celebrate this move. Um, Shannon Power, who was up until recently a reporter for Gay Star News, uh, wrote a big old long thing in The Independent, which I'll link to, which called out all of the people celebrating the closure of Gay Star News because there was a lot of turf basically saying this is a good thing because gay star news were trans inclusive and it's like is it really a good thing if an lgbt media organization no longer exists one less voice for queer people in the media is that how much you hate trans people sorry but whenever these people are forever going to say oh this is all about lesbians and it's like really there was a pride parade i want to say leeds pride parade where there was a mermaids parade entry of course and and lots of many, many other organisations, lots of, you know, flag waving and so on. There were a couple of, uh, really not very many, of the, you know, self uh, people who call themselves feminists there who uh, did not receive the most welcoming response from the people of Leeds, which warmed the cockles of my heart, I have to say. But then afterwards on Twitter, one of the usual suspects, the sort of turf in chief, Posey Parker, just went straight on with the equating gay people with paedophiles. So they don't care about protecting lesbians. They don't care about protecting gay men. They don't care about protecting trans kids. They don't actually care about protecting anybody. They are just bigots. And so some people who are lesbians who have allied themselves with them may be finding themselves a bit shocked at the rhetoric. Well, I mean, I got into it for the transphobia because I hate trans people, but it turns out these people are just <laughs> awful. And it's like, well, you're you're pretty awful too, I've got to say. However, this, you know, group of people which are standing for the same goals, um, some of whom are lesbians who hate trans people, and some of them are cis people who hate trans people and lesbians as well, you know, as much as they... Well, I mean, I keep saying scratch a transphobe, find a racist, and I've yet to be proven wrong. It's also the the paedophile thing came out when we was fighting for the equal age of consent mm. for gay men. Um, going back, that was what they said, oh, these older men now will be going for children. When they just wanted an equal age of consent, I mean, to say it's the same rhetoric, just aimed at a different community there's nothing new under the sun for these people there is not you're you're absolutely right and that's something that has been observed repeatedly i think is that it's literally the same arguments the same homophobic arguments that were seen in the press about how the gays are coming to convert your children kind of thing and it has simply been repurposed and fired at the trans community and i'm astonished that more people don't remember this people who are outside of the lgbt community who were reading newspapers and news articles and stuff i'm astonished that it was like, oh yeah i had not noticed that i was like how did you not know? Oh, never mind. Yeah, like, people our age, we sort of grew up in the thick of... You were at school in Section... Yeah, I was out there fighting Section 28. We were. On the committees and stuff. No, no, I mean, just, I'm just yeah. saying that, you and know... Thank you. God, I'm that old. But no, there was lots of people that was... It was the whole community fought it. It wasn't just, like, gay men or lesbians. It was everybody joining together. And, you know, I mean, I'd have been there if I'd known uh, how queer I was uh, at that age, but still. Like, so for my entire educational career, Section 28 was in force. Uh, it was only, you know, taken off the books in, what was it, 2003, which was just as I left college. So, like, oh, great, wonderful stuff. So, yeah, that was my gap year. <laughs> 
Oh, you did a gap year. It's like I missed the boat. <laughs> well, I worked in a shop for a year to buy a ah, computer. Yes. I basically did the gap year that like normal people. Yeah, do. yeah, I did something similar to be honest. You know, I would have, I would have really liked it if gay people were actually recruiting in the schools because then someone would have been able to come up to me and said, you know, you have these strange feelings about the Disney's version of Robin Hood. That's okay, and I know that's okay now because Kimmy Schmidt in her show, like on Netflix, made a joke about how she used to feel weird about Robin Hood in Disney's Robin Hood. Hmm. And I was just like, ah, oh, I wasn't completely strange. So are you talking about the animated one where he's a fox thing? Yes. Right. So cool. I had a thing for Fox Robin Hood when I was like seven. Fair enough. Fair enough. That is um, apparently a common thing. People on Twitter back me up here. Please get in touch and tell me that this isn't just me. Because it, it's me. Right now it's me and the fictional character of Kimmy Schmidt. I can't be the only one who had that. I mean, probably not. <laughs> Furries are a thing, so you know that's that's a thing. I didn't grow up to be a furry. No, well, there's nothing wrong with I... someone being a furry. <laughs> well, you know, I absolutely not. No, no, no. I, we are... I know. I'm not saying there is. I'm saying it just didn't happen for me. <laughs> like I didn't grow up to become a furry. My furry days were only when I was a child. That was strange. I think we should move on. I this do. Is... I also think we should my move on. My mum listens to this show. I mean, <laughs> oh my god. Hello, oh. Michelle's mum. How are you? <laughs> She's probably her head and her hands are just whining like, oh, who did I raise? <laughs> Lots of young women do get attached to their furry toys. Very true. It's very true. Oh, I saw a brilliant quote about this actually on Twitter, which is don't date somebody who makes you feel like you have to hide your stuffed animals. Hmm. And I think that's good life advice. Yeah, that is really good life advice. Yeah. Anyway, so let's let's power on through with our final but, I guess, meatiest news story for this particular week. Um, and again, if you're listening to this from outside of the UK, I'm sorry, but you're shit out of luck on this one because this is about specifically a UK piece of legislation which has had a lot of uh, discourse around it in recent weeks and we wanted to set a few things straight, which unfortunately meant that we had to go in and try and understand this stuff ourselves. And it turns out it's very, very complicated and a little bit dry, so please do bear with us. Because up next, we are going to have a look at the Equality Act of 2010. So as I mentioned, some of this might get a little in-depth and we should say at the start, from the top, that nobody on this recording is a legal professional. Do not use this podcast instead of seeking legal advice. That would be a terrible idea. In the description, though, we've included links to a couple of actual lawyers who do work in with, you know, with this stuff who might be able to help you if you do have a specific legal grievance or have queries about a case. So... The Women and Equalities Committee, who we've mentioned before, have been looking into the issue of how the Equality Act from 2010 is actually enforced, and have just published their report, which has been titled Enforcing the Equality Act. To get to grips with this report, though, first we do have to talk about what the Equality Act actually is. So, in 2010, the Equality Act was put together with the goal of unifying and consolidating all of the previous equal rights protections for various groups in law into one ostensibly easily digestible government act. Uh, so it includes discrimination protections for people based on many of what it calls protected characteristics. And so your protected characteristics are age, disability, race, religion or belief, sex, and etc. Trans people are also included in this, and our protected characteristic is described as gender reassignment, which is problematic as fuck in itself, but we'll get back to that later. Now, it's worth noting here that the Women and Equalities Committee is headed by Conservative MP Maria Miller and is a totally separate entity from the Government Equalities Office, which is run by Women and Equalities Minister Amber Rudd. <sighs> so the Women and Equalities <laughs> Committee's role is to investigate various issues and to recommend to the government what actions to take, whereas Amber Rudd's role as the Minister for Women and Equalities is to decide on how best to act on the recommendations from that committee. So the Women and Equalities Committee's inquiry into the Equality Act and its enforcement is not a sign in itself that the government is going to take action on this, but if that changes, we will let you know. Now, the Equality Act does protect trans people in most regards, but does have some exceptions. It does say that gender Gender reassignment is a protected characteristic in almost all cases, but there are exceptions where organisations can ignore gender reassignment in specific circumstances. So, to get an informed opinion on this, those exceptions, how they work, how the Equality Act work, Michelle sat down and spoke to Tara Hewitt, who is a co-founder of the Trans Equality Legal Initiative and is the Group Equality and Inclusion Programme Manager for the NHS. So let's play the tape! 
Tara Hewitt, co-founder of Telly. Thank you for talking to me today. How are you doing? I'm great, Michelle. It's great to join you. Thank you for having us on the show. The Equality Act is quite complicated and long and big, and I've been having trouble getting my head around it. Could you briefly sum up in what areas does the Equality Act of 2010 legally protect trans people? So the Equality Act just extended existing provision that existed prior to 2010 to make it more in par with existing legislation around race discrimination, sex discrimination, um, sexual orientation discrimination. And it, it did that actually across the board to make it that hence the Equality Act only really have one act to make sure that people's rights were comparable across what they called protected characteristics, which are basically traits which as society we deem are innate. They're traits that most of us have. So we all have an age, which is a protected characteristic. We all may have a gender or don't have a gender, which is a protected characteristic or is sometimes described as sex, but it's often used interchangeably in law. Um, we all have a sexual orientation. Um, we all either have a religion and belief or don't have a religion and belief. Um, and so the law basically came about to um, equalise those protections. And for trans people, that meant a bit of an extension. It meant that you were uh, protected from discrimination based on indirect discrimination, which basically means um, when you do something to everybody, but it disproportionately impacts on another individual, on a protected group specifically. So, for example, um, using another group, um, if you are a GP's practice and you say the only way you can book an appointment is via telephone, you're not specifically discriminating against anybody, but you would be indirectly discriminating against people that, for example, can't use a telephone, say, because they're deaf. Um, so it, it really just uh, provided that equalisation in law. And it was a great piece of legislation which the last Labour government brought brought about just before the coalition took over in 2010. And trans people were protected under a protected characteristic named gender reassignment, which is probably where some of the challenges sit and also gives an indication of the legacy of a lack of knowledge uh, for those that make law, those that sit in parliament, particularly back in 2010, where that language I felt was clumsy then and is definitely clumsy now and isn't really language any of us use both in a community or basically in an academic sense anywhere. Um, but we're stuck with it because it's what was put in the law back in 2010. Right, so it protects us in regards to workplace discrimination, both direct and indirect. It protects us legally in a whole bunch of other areas. So in the Equality Act, there are a couple of exemptions where trans people are exempted from being covered in the Equality Act, specifically in Schedule 3 and Schedule 23. So as you said, trans people are protected like other protected characters characteristics and communities from weight place discrimination, accessing services, discrimination in everyday life, um, which is what any progressive country's equality laws should be there to do, and also stem back to basic human rights freedoms that come both from the European Union, um, from the um, European Court of Human Rights and the Human Rights Act. Um, there isn't the exemptions and the language that used around them is quite misleading. Um, what the Equality Act does is provide a limited amount of defence for somebody if they wish to discriminate against trans people effectively or wish to apply the law in such a way that would lead to trans people being discriminated in a limited set of circumstances if they choose to. So there is no right to for somebody to demand an organisation discriminates against trans people. It's just that in a very limited set of circumstances, if uh, which we're going to go and talk through in a, in a second, um, are met then somebody can use something which in law is called objective justification, which allows you to, um, as we said, discriminate against trans people. The, the language that the law uses is, is quite a well-known test under the Equality Act. It's used quite broadly across all of the protected characteristics in relation to indirect discrimination. Um, and it's called the proportional means to achieve a legitimate aim. Um, and so you need to be able to demonstrate that the reason why you are choosing to discriminate is a proportional means, so that's on balance, is what you are doing going to be better than the harm that you're going to cause to trans people by discriminating against them? And that's a 50-50 balance test based on the facts. Is there no other way of achieving that aim? That's why it's proportionate. So is there anything you could do that would have less of an impact and less discriminatory? You can't just jump to the solution that you would like. You have to demonstrate that there was no other way of doing it. And people would look to other organisations and other situations to balance that probability. 
And then is what you're trying to achieve actually legitimate? Is the aim actually something which should be done? Um, and so in law, that's thinking about situations where um, it, it that, that what you're trying to do is a weighty belief. It's something that's there to protect an aspect of human life. It's trying to create, It's a, it has a serious level of seriousness, a serious level of importance. And it must also be worthy of respect in a democratic society. It can't be, um, it, it's, it can't be compa incompatible with human dignity and it can't conflict with the fundamental rights of trans people. So it's a legal test on when these are applied. And by the language that I've just described, talking about balance tests and talking about all of these different parameters having to be met, there's no blanket rule. This would be on a case by case basis, based on the facts in a situation, an organisation would have to apply. How often are these exemptions used? Uh, do, you, do you know? I think it's impossible to, um, to, to be able to give that. The case law is still very limited in this area. But within sport, um, most of the professional bodies, if not all, already have guidance in place around when and how the ensure trans people are participating. By the nature of that, that's treating trans people differently to cisgender athletes from an indirect discrimination point of view and so they're all applying those exemptions in the way that they limit the acts because the exemptions aren't necessarily to refuse they're about the ability to treat a trans person differently and to the minimum extent that you need to treat them differently to achieve that aim and so again when we're trying to come up with the appropriate um, rules within sport those rules need to be the minimum that's needed to ensure that that sport is kept fair um, and that everybody's still able to participate and, and meet the aims of whatever that sporting activity um, is. And so that's probably the most public way recently we've seen that played out. As I said already, the domestic abuse services are where the statutory guidance specifically references it may be needed, but the current um, I said the, the current research has shown that it's either never used or it's very rarely used, even by some of those organisations that a limited number that have maybe come out critically of trans people. And there's only a, a small handful of those um, that we've heard in the media. They themselves have said that they actually haven't applied that exemption, even if they agree that they would like to at some point, but they've not found a circumstance where they would. So I think that provides a suggestion that it isn't used and maybe isn't needed needed in a way to keep people safe or to ensure that rights are in place, that actually there's the, the Equality Act works perfectly fine um, in, in that regard without those exemptions needing to be applied. So what are your issues with the Equality Act in this area as it stands? Do you think that there needs to be reform? So I think the Equality Act was a good evolutionary step from where we were um, prior to 2010. And there was a real need to bring all of our equalities protection together. It really got rid of the idea that you needed any type of medical intervention. And um, I often describe it as introducing, or at least initially introducing the concept of self ID because it's individual ID. It's about you living permanently in a particular gender role. There's no time period. There's no medical intervention needing to be demonstrated to gain that protection that exists currently under the Equality Act 2010. But I do think there's definitely some weakness and it, it, it definitely in the medium to long term needs to be reviewed. I'm, I'm not sure that now is the right time to push for that with one of the most right wing governments that have an agenda which is clearly not supportive of the trans community and any attempt would be I think, used to erode trans protections um, as they stand now. But one, the terminology of gender reassignment isn't language that anybody uses, and um, neither is the term transsexual, which is used throughout the Act. Um, and it confuses people when you say, please don't use that word, but yet it, it's used continuously through the legislation as it was written in 2010, which was outdated then and is definitely outdated now. But it also excludes people who are non-binary. Um, so the current legislation as it stands, and it hasn't necessarily been tested to its full extent, but most of the commentary believes that non-binary people generally aren't included by gender reassignment as a protected characteristic unless they're perceived to have permanently transitioned to a different gender to resort assign them to at birth. And by gender, I'm talking in a binary sense because of the way it's likely to be interpreted by the courts. But again, um, there isn't a precedent on that and it would be for a court to, to finally decide that either way. But 
feel it would be unlikely if that was included. So terminology that was non-binary inclusive, so such as gender identity um, rather than gender reassignment, may be a, a, a better uh, protected characteristic. Um, we've heard already from women's services um, and domestic abuse services that say that they don't use the current exemption provisions. And we've seen vast abuse of that narrative in the media using people's lay interpretation of legislation um, to confuse people, to even confuse service providers that maybe don't have resource and access to an equalities team or to proper legal advice in this area. Um, and I think that there, there is a real case to review those provisions to see if they're workable, if they're effective, are they achieving anything? Because if they're not being used, really, why are they there? Does there just need to be some very specific statutory exemptions, which are a, a, a defined one way or another rather than a test? Or does the test need to be made um, even more restrictive than it is now? And I think that that would be an area that would need to be reviewed and discussed. But this idea that trans people are a danger, which again is often what's used and built in, I don't know any protected characteristic that is viewed as a danger in law. Um, it's individuals that may be a danger, and that isn't their protected characteristic of trans. And I think nobody is against safeguarding and excluding individuals, whether they're trans or cisgender, black or white, gay or straight. If somebody is a bad person or they're a person that is a danger to other people, we need safeguarding against those people based on their behaviour, not on their protected characteristics. So for me, that's the direction of travel that we need to be getting our law to, to go in, in in the longer term. And maybe that's the narrative that we need to get into the media is that it's behaviour that needs legislated against, not a protected characteristic. Uh, Tara, thank you very much for talking to me. So firstly, many thanks to Tara for coming in and explaining all of this stuff to us. Um, so as she said, there are a few things that are or have been misused by certain groups when it comes to the concept of an exemption to the Equality Act. And it is also clear that the Equality Act does have a huge part to play for trans equality in the UK. So obviously any moves made by politicians would need to be watched, as this potentially could have huge implications for the UK trans community. So. Here's the breakdown of the report from the Select Committee. The report makes the case that currently, the burden of enforcement tends to land on the individual and their legal actions. For example, if a gay man was turned away from a nightclub for being gay, for the Equality Act to enforce, he would have to sue the nightclub under the Equality Act. So the onus of responsibility to take action is on the individual themselves. The report states that it calls for the EHRC, which is the Equality Human Rights Commission, calls for the EHRC to be less timid and calls on the burden of enforcement, not on individual case law, but to be handled by regulators, inspectorates and ombudsmen, not least from the government's Labour Market Enforcement Director, who we believe should be playing a fundamental role alongside the proposed new single Labour Market Enforcement Body. If such bodies acted consistently on their obligations, the Equality and Human Rights Commission could become the strategic enforcer that it and the government say that it should be. So in brief, the Equality and Human Rights Commission needs to be given more power and given more agency to be able to prosecute and bring cases like this themselves rather than leaving the burden of individual responsibility on a particular person. Legal action is expensive. I, I know this. Um, you know, we've looked. I've seen it on telly. It looks expensive. It is. It it is expensive, basically. So to leave the burden of responsibility for some fairly basic equalities law enforcement to put that responsibility on people who can afford it is is one of the things that Tara mentioned in the interview that perhaps needs to be revisited. In so the report goes on to say, just quickly uh, at the end, the EHRC should retain its strategic role in ensuring that the law is clear and both enforced and enforceable by others. So, Diana, you gave evidence to the committee, so what is your take on the report? Are you happy with this particular recommendation? As always with these things, it's not so much what they wrote, but how it's interpreted. And do they actually give these, this body any mm. funding to actually do the job? Or is it a selection of words to make people feel good, but there's nothing actually going to change or be done about it? If someone complains to this to these people, are they actually going to do anything about it? Can they afford to do anything about it? That's fair. That's I mean, it's a valid question. Recommendations are one thing, and action mm. action is another, isn't it? But I remember prior to the report 
coming out. Obviously, the report was put together. And when it was uh, announced that the select committee were going to be looking at this particular element of the Equality Act and its enforcement, I do recall a certain amount of cheering from the camp of the people who claim to be feminists by saying that, oh, well, they're going to reform it so we can kick all the trans women out of domestic violence shelters and wherever else. Hello everyone, just dropping in once again to let you know the next section of the show contains discussions in and around the policies of domestic abuse shelters. So please do take that under advisement. Now, back to the past. Well, when I was reading the report, I gave the whole thing a read Mm. and then I went down and read in depth the uh, pages they had on these exceptions. Specifically, the exceptions are in the act as Schedule 3, Parts 26, 27, and in Schedule 27, I believe. It's a big old act. This is like hundreds, at least 100 pages of act in here with all sorts of different terms going through it. But the actual exemptions, the wording itself, is quite vague in some respects. It doesn't necessarily outline specifically what these exemptions, how the exemptions should be handled. And Tara said something similar, whereas there's not that much case law on the subject. They've sort of started um, interpreting it a certain way, and that's Mm. been the way it's been going. Yes, I remember that. It doesn't sound like these um, exemptions have necessarily been used that much. And it's coming up, and it's been, what, eight years of this act existing, so I don't understand why people haven't been using them if they've been there, if you know what I mean. Like, I mean, turfs have not just suddenly cropped up over the last three years. They've been around the whole time. Why are they only talking about this now? Because they want to make the uh, exemption stronger. They want to make it easier for there to be exemptions. And they're not easy to use at the moment because you've got to make a clear Mm. argument and there isn't one to back up what they say because trans women and trans men Mm. have been in refuges, well, pretty much for years and years and years. And certainly in the last decade or more, Mm. when it's been a bit more open that trans women have been going through refuge, there's not been one case of any issue at all. So they can't, yeah, they can't back up what they're saying because there is actually no case that they can say where it was particularly used in the way that they're trying to say it. Almost as if they're not being honest about something. <laughs> How strange. Ooh, mm. Supreme. I know, right? Crazy shit. Yeah, when I was watching um, your evidence session, when you were giving evidence to the select committee, I remember specifically that I think it was Maria Miller was asking for specific examples of where the presence of trans people has been a problem. And the one person on the committee whose name escapes me now, who is adamantly against trans people, it would seem, like they referred to the idea that a trans woman can be legally defined as female as a legal fiction. Hmm. Was that was that Davis, Philip T.C. Davis, uh, MP for, I want to say, somewhere in Yorkshire? Oh, no, no, no. This is um, a lady who runs near. Mm. Oh, um, oh, well, never mind then. She, she runs um, a, a, a crisis service in East London. Right. Um, she said that the one time that she could remember that there was a problem was a trans person that may have worked for them 10 years ago, but couldn't give any more details on what that was. So I basically see. there was nothing. Yeah. There was like, essentially, like she was making these big, long speeches about how, you know, trans people are going to cause all these issues. But when actually directly asked, she couldn't really come up with one except for a third of an anecdote from a decade ago. Mm. About someone who was employed there and not... Yeah, she went in for this whole long rigmarole about it. And then when they looked across at me and the woman from Women's Aid and says, well, have you got any examples? We both looked at each other, looked at them and said, no. Because who haven't? Mm. Neither of us have come across one single example where the exemption's been used. And in the refuges that I've worked with, we've never had one single actual problem. That means not one single Mm. person that's a cis woman that's been in refuge has complained or made a formal complaint. Not one particular issue where a trans woman has had to be ejected for being trans. She could have been rejected for other reasons, but not for being trans. So, Diana, you've worked in um, domestic abuse refuges for a good long while now. Mm -hmm. Both academically and on the cold face, as people call it. I've got no idea why they would call it the cold face. Ain't no coal. It's like saying on the shop floor. It's like this, this is not a shop. So I think it's worth pointing out that we're going to segue very stylishly (laughs) um, from, from the news segment to what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the episode, which is, of course, the 
main reason we have invited Diana along to come and talk to us uh, about her work within the refuges and uh, a couple of points that we wanted to get out there. So this is where the terrible news is slowly turning into a lump of meat. Yes, yes. You see how we're doing the chewy bit. Yes, 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 yes. This is this is where the protein is. Diana, you've worked in refuges for a good long while. Do you believe, based on your experiences, that the exemptions are needed? Needed and used, no. But do they give some organisations a feeling of comfort? Sort of like having that thing there that you know you're never, ever going to use and you're never, ever going to need it. But you've got sort of like comforted by the fact that it's still there. Do you see what I mean by that? that? Yeah. They know that they're not going to need it. They've never needed it. Nobody they've ever worked with has ever needed it. But with all the stuff that's been going on, there's that feeling that, well, I know I'm not going to need it, but just having that extra piece of rope in case I need to grab hold of it for any reason is useful to have. So I kind of think that that's the reason it's being put in, not because it's needed, but because it gives some organisations a sense of security. It's like that extra insurance policy you never really needed and never really used, but it's there anyway. Yeah, I think uh, with a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people get the exemptions wrong, as Tara mentioned and as we've mentioned a little bit. I think to put it bluntly, there's going to be some people out there who will be horrified that these these exception, these exemptions exist. The element of proof that they would need to be able to use one of these exemptions is a very high bar. So mm. there would have to be something pretty serious for them to use the exemption. Because And if it's something serious about the person that's going into refuge, i.e. they've had a previous past where they were the abuser or they've had... Um, a criminal record for violence where they won't be allowed in the refuge. Mm. That is exactly the same that would be used for any person, male or female, trans, non-binary, gender fluid. It makes no difference. They've got a history of violence. They won't be allowed in the refuge. Yeah. But with the Equality Act, it makes the point that you can exempt the protections for gender reassignment people, which is... Oy. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's that's not a good no, phrase. Like, it that doesn't necessarily. So as I say, I think that that's the reason that it's there is to give somebody a sense of comfort yeah. rather than an actuality of mm. ever having to actually use it. Because in refuge, you wouldn't use it. It would you would have to be basically transphobic to want to use that because there are so many other safeguards that if that person broke those safeguards, yeah. that they would be excluded for good reason, not for their trans status. Because they're trans. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's really that's what it comes down to, isn't it? Is that there's this um been a lot of rhetoric around what these exemptions mean and it's like oh well you know blanket exemptions could come in and i you know i don't think there was ever any really any risk of that given the fact that women's refuge organizations are, are trans inclusive for the most part and have yeah, been for very a long, long time. time terribly annoying that it, the discussion around it has been kind of hijacked in this way because as you say to use that exemption to say oh we're, you know we're just going to preemptively not let any of this type of person in uh that's i mean that's very mm -hmm. much not how it works uh despite yeah we've received statements from the ministry of justice and a few other people that have made it clear that the government and government agencies view the exemptions as to be used for, spe for against specific people yeah in specific circumstances it's not just like all trans people it's like this one trans person did x therefore we're not going to offer them the same protections as other protected characteristics is that is that something um, that you can speak to diana the thing that i can really speak to around the exemption thing the only thing that i can think of the only reason i can think that it's still there is because of all this stink that was kicked up by the transphobes. Because they kicked up all this stink, that it's raised a load of smoke, so it stayed. Had they not raised this smoke, and we just simply sat there and answered the questions of the select committee, I think it would have been dropped. Because it's not mm. used. It's never it's never really been used. So what's the point in having it? Do you think that if... I mean, I don't see this as a likely scenario. What with the government being... Well, the makeup of it now, as well as all the Brexit stuff that's going on. If the Equality and Human Rights Commission did start to act on this more, do you think there would be more exemptions? No, because the, the people who are mostly women, but not exclusively, because there are men's refuges where there are 
some men working in them, wouldn't stand for it. Because the majority of the women that I've worked with in different refuges and different places are very strongly opposed to anyone who is in need of a refuge space being excluded from a refuge. If you are qualified for that place, i.e. you do not have a record of violence, for some places it's drug and alcohol use because of the insurance and other things, then you are entitled to that place. You will be given that place. There are policies in place for anything that happens within a refuge to be sorted out within refuge. You do not need to exclude someone. Obviously, men go to a men's refuge, women go to a women's refuge. So trans women go to a women's refuge, trans men go to a male refuge. That's yeah, that's exactly how it's been working for the past donkey's years without an issue. And it will continue to do so because the women that work in there that have are dedicated to helping people who have suffered domestic abuse to find somewhere safe, to help them rebuild their lives, and then when they leave, to help them go on to lead a, a fulfilling life that they are happy with. That is the only aim of a refuge. It is not to judge someone mm. for whatever characteristic they have, what their religion is, uh, who their abuser was. That That is not the issue with refuge. The only thing is to make someone safe, make them feel cared for, give them the confidence to run their own lives when they leave refuge and perhaps their children and take care of them as well. That is the only reason for refuge right so when it comes to um these refuges domestic abuse what is the situation when it comes to trans people um in your experience how often do trans people use these services not as often as they should because they a lot of trans people don't feel that those refuges or domestic abuse services are for them but they are the, the refugees I work with, they're trained to deal with LGBT people, and that includes people that are trans or non-binary or gender fluid. So there's areas of abuse that are different from heterosexual and cis people. So there are differences in that abuse, and they are trained to recognise what those differences are and how to talk to that person. That's the issue. It's just giving people the understanding that these services are for you. They are there for you. But there's Gallup, if you feel that you want to speak to someone who is trans and has a training in domestic abuse, then get in touch with Gallup. They are a fantastic service. They are fantastic people. They are highly trained, highly motivated. And they are there for members of our own community who are there with an understanding of what you're going through and will be able to help you. And there will be a link in the description as always. Hey everyone, just dropping in once again to let you know that the rest of the episode will contain discussions around the specific forms that domestic abuse can take. So please take that under advisement. And if anything in this show has affected you, please listen for after the music at the end of the show for some information on where to get some help. Now, back to the show. So I think what I'd like to do next, Diana, is um, ask a couple of things about domestic abuse itself, which is not a particularly easy or fun topic, but as you've said, since there are trans and non-binary people who experience domestic abuse, this unfortunately is a conversation that we need to have. So what what is it that you, as someone who has worked in, you know, kind of with refugees for a long time, what is it that trans people need to know about it? And not just in terms of accessing services, but what should, what do we need to know, what do we need to do and, and be aware of? Domestic abuse is the term that we use now rather than domestic violence and the reason for that is a lot of people think domestic violence is all about someone being physically abused as in slapped or whatever but that's not true because abuse takes so many different levels it's so much different there is coercive which we've heard a lot about in the news recently about coercive control it's someone telling you what to wear how you look um what you should do what friends you should have how you spend your money, how you spend your time. So it's all of those different things. But things that are particularly effective against trans people, removal from your support networks, for instance, uh, taking you away from where you might get um, your psychological support, taking away from where you might get counselling, um, undermining your self-image. So it's this sort of steady drip 
a verbal abuse. You look like a drag queen or a little girl trying to be a man. It's those kind of comments and using your, as the terminology goes, dead name and, you know, calling you your original gender, using that sort of thing. And there is, of course, other kinds of things, removal of medication, hiding your clothes, your Mm. binder. um, And then there's also sexual abuse. And one of the worst kinds of abuse that's particularly effective with trans people is IBSA, which is image-based sexual abuse. So this is what um, people in the press have called, like, revenge porn. I don't swear, but Mm. I would really swear at that because it's got very little to do with revenge. It's all about control, and it's not porn when someone's Mm. been abused and made to do things. Porn is about agreement. It is about what you choose to do and how you choose to do it. Image-based sexual abuse is that. It's image-based sexual abuse. And that's what it is, because it's used to body shame. With the use of smartphones, the quality of still and moving images is now so high that with the increase in like porn sites dedicated to shaming, particularly but not exclusively women, they call girlfriend or ex-girlfriend mm. sites. And they're predominantly used for shaming or to show off places for men's ego. And IBSA is used as that. So they put these pictures up on these sites to be judged by other men as to how sexy those images are. So they give a percentage. So for those women then who feel that they've been used for that to go on to these sites to then see if they're on there, they're seeing images of other women. So that denigration is then making them feel filthy and wrong for seeing the fact that it's been done to other women. Yeah, I don't know mm. if um I don't know if he invented this, but Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook guy, basically made one of these sites when he was a Harvard. Is uh-huh. that kind of what you're talking about? Well, no, these are particularly made basically to denigrate women more than they are to just show sort of like pictures of someone's girlfriend. They are used in a particular way. And of course, pre surgery, there is an awful lot of cis straight guys out there that have got a, shall we say, an interest in those kind of pictures. And those kind of pictures taken and put up on such sites or the threat of that being done will keep someone in a relationship that's an abusive one for longer than they may otherwise have been in it. So as a method of control, it is particularly evil. I don't use that word very often because evil is just an excuse for what bad people do. But it is particularly nasty and vile thing for someone to do to someone that they thought loved them. It is. And I've heard lots, uh, well, not lots, but a number of um, stories and testimonials from the States and the UK, really, which I am not going to go into the details of. But uh, there's a a thread that ran through each of the things, each of the ones that I read about was simply that the trans person who was in the relationship and was experiencing truly horrific levels of treatment in some cases, physical and otherwise, um, who was also being kind of denigrated to the extent that, you know, you can't go anywhere else. Everywhere else just thinks you're a whatever. You can't get help. You have to stay here with me. And so that's more is put up Mm. with more can be got more can be gotten away with in that sense. And again, for some people having that level of power over somebody is, well, it's exactly what they want. And God, I, I feel a bit sick. Yes, so do I. And this I'm I'm not doing very well talking about this. Well, society itself is already grooming a transgender person before the abuser gets hold of them, because it's society is telling us mm. what we are, what we aren't, and attacking us. So we've been almost prepared for an abuser to take that over and take it to the next level. So society, as it is at the moment, is grooming us for an abuser. I had actually not thought about it like that. I just hadn't made that specific connection. So I'm just going to take it up a little, if I may, to say that and to stress that, to come in with what you said earlier, there are services that exist to support people who are in that position Absolutely. No matter what they are in terms of being trans or, or binary where or gender you are fluid, in your transition. Exactly. No matter, it, irrespective of those things, you can get help. There are organisations that help. Gallup, G-A-L-O-P is definitely one of them. Mm. Fine people. Um, 
if there's a very sort of complex dialogue that um, a lot of places have, I think best summed up by saying if you are genuinely affected by any of the issues that we are discussing in this evening's podcast, then there are some services that exist to assist and links to those will be placed in the description of the podcast. Yeah, London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard, or Switchboard as it's now known as another one that they've had training around domestic abuse, not to the level of Gallup who specialise, but nevertheless they've had it. And it doesn't matter what you've done to earn a living, you can be a sex worker. If you are living with domestic abuse, it doesn't matter what you've done in the past or how you've earned your living or been forced to earn your living. That help is there for you, irrespective of that. It makes no difference. I think in conversations um, we've had, Diana, before Mm. recording, I think you've mentioned that trans people statistically are more likely to suffer uh, domestic abuse than anyone else. Is that the case? It is. Um, It's along with people that are bisexual are the two highest in percentage points. Not numbers, of course, but in percentage, they are the two highest, yes. Because, unfortunately, some abusers out there, they see the vulnerability of a trans person, and that's what they're looking for, is someone who's vulnerable. And the two most abused groups, as far as sexuality and gender are concerned, are obviously trans people and people who are bisexual who are generally denigrated by both the LG and sometimes T community and the straight community as well. As in um, a woman that's been living with a woman is welcome within the LGBT community. As soon as she then switches her affections, maybe after that relationship ends to a guy, she's no longer welcome. She's seen as straight. She's not. She's still queer. She's still bi. But she just happens to be with a guy at the moment. And the same for a man. You know, that's the way that our community has been working. And that's very anti-bisexual and therefore places them in a more vulnerable position to be abused. But sex workers are particularly vulnerable, of course, to that same kind of abuse and levels of abuse. And sometimes a trans person, if they don't feel they can get work in another way, sex work to try and save up for various operations that they might want or need is a way of earning that money. If they can't wait for the years and years and years, or if they've been seen for whatever reason to be turned down for it, which can be due to psychological reasons, or the fact that they found out they did have a history as a sex worker and have decided to refuse um, treatment, that sex work is their only way to get that money. And they can be abused through that by their abuser or by a pimp or whatever, by taking that money away from them. And also the risk there is of having having sex with cis men who are looking for a trans preoperative woman. But then when they've had sex with that woman, they then sort of come up with these sort of like their internalised homophobia comes out. It's almost like a self-hate of themselves and they take it out on the woman and they can rob her, beat her take away her stuff, theft of money, and he walks away feeling self-righteous. He was tricked. He was doing society a favour. And if he's challenged, he'll feel put upon and not understand why you don't think as he does. It's that queer you should be talking to, not me. That's the way that some of these guys act. And that's the risk that a lot of women in the profession take when they try and get money for surgery one of the many 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 reasons why people should be supportive of sex workers in general a hundred percent a hundred percent which was why at trans pride in brighton there was the sex workers there and i bought one of their bags and i bought some of their badges nice i couldn't afford to buy any of their stuff (laughs) but i put them on the show instead so hopefully i did my bit yeah absolutely well i think and and really that's kind of all any of us uh can can really do um and so there's something I did want to ask, and this is, I think a lot of people that stay in situations where they are being abused, because in some respects they don't know that they're in a, an abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So this may be a really, really crass way of asking, but what are the signs? Like if someone out there doesn't have suspicions that they are in an abusive relationship. Then the chances are they are. If you feel that you might be in an abusive relationship, the chances are reasonable that you might be. It could be 
they don't want you to do certain things. They don't want you to go certain places or to speak to certain people. Um, they want you to have a joint account, but there's never as much money in it there as you thought. They don't like you saving money or keeping things back. They may want you to dress in certain ways. Anything like that that's sort of things that you would normally not want to put up with. If you're unsure, speak to someone. Phone up one of the domestic abuse helplines and speak to someone. If you can't get on to Gallup, who tend to run at office hours, you can phone Switchboard, who run up to 10 o'clock at night. Or there are other domestic abuse helplines that you can phone. Should you get a rare service that just doesn't understand or want to understand your issues, do not think you're being rejected. It's that person, not you, that's at fault. So find another service who will. But please ask and ask about what your feelings are, how things are going with you. And that person on the other end of the phone can help you. Um, to either leave that relationship or make plans to, or if it's at the very beginning, to maybe talk to the person that you're with and to say, this is not how a relationship should work. Maybe they don't know any better. But that person will be able to tell you if you're in an abusive relationship and what you can do to get out of it. There are refuge spaces if you need to leave that space because you're in fear of being hurt or your children being hurt. There are refuge spaces for you and councils. If you leave that relationship and you've got nowhere to go, a council has a duty of responsibility to house you. This is not a choice. They have to, even if it's an emergency accommodation for a couple of nights until you can get into a refuge. They do not have a choice. Which is actually useful to know. <laughs> I didn't know that. Mm. I had no idea. And when you say temporary housing, you're talking like a B&B &B or something. A bed and breakfast, yeah, a, be a bed and breakfast or uh, other temporary accommodation that a council may have just for a few nights, maybe until they can get you into a refuge or to find you other accommodation if a refuge isn't suitable for you for whatever reason. But they have a duty of responsibility to house someone that's fleeing domestic abuse. They do not have a choice. And that's regardless of trans status as well. Trans it doesn't status matter who you are. It. it doesn't matter yeah. male, female, trans, whatever. It doesn't make any difference. You are a human being and you are fleeing domestic abuse. You are entitled. Good to know. Okay, I think I put that firmly enough. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm quite certain that you did. Um, I... Just in case anybody missed that, you are entitled. Nah. If that wasn't yes. clear. <laughs> yes. I think all three of us have spent quite a lot of this episode being very, very emphatic. Yeah, it's an emphatic thing because it's so incredibly serious for everybody. Anybody in the LGBT community has to know that that services are there for you, especially if you're trans and you're frightened and you're frightened of how you're going to be treated in a refuge. Will you be accepted? Will it be OK? Will you be safe? Will you be thrown out for no reason if someone else says, complains to one of the people in the refuge and says, well, I don't like her. I think she looked at me funny. That will be dealt with. It's not that person will not be automatically believed. It will be gone into. They will ask you what you feel. They will ask the other person what they feel. And it will be sorted out with policies. Nobody's word is taken over another person's. You will not lose your place because someone doesn't like you or doesn't like trans people. If they make transphobic remarks, they're the person that is going to get the warning, not you. Good. <laughs> As it should be, frankly. Yeah. Um, I think, is there anything else that you would consider it important to pass on to our lovely listeners before we bring this little sojourn into uh, this area to a close? Yeah. If you decide that you're going to go to the police then reporting to the police because you've been physically hurt or for whatever other reason, you can, if you report to the police, you should be treated with complete respect. You should not be treated any other way than any other man or woman fleeing domestic abuse. If you do not feel you've been treated that way, there is a complaints procedure which is quite firm and that officer, if it has felt that they have not dealt with the situation correctly 
will be retrained or will be spoken to very seriously. I'm not saying that this is going to happen every time, that you're going to find the the angel police officer who's going to help you because there is a percentage, they are members of society and you can get a bad one as well as a good one. But there is ways around it. And if you report to a domestic abuse hotline and you say that you've been treated badly, most domestic abuse units have contacts within the police and can put your case forwards. I work with the police and I work with the police a lot. And the vast majority are there to because they want to do the job. They want to help people. They want to, they're not there to make themselves look big. But you're always going to get the odd one. It's just a damn shame that it happens at that can happen at the worst possible time. Like, because I imagine yeah, exactly. people fleeing abuse are, you know, pretty psychologically vulnerable Hurt. and fragile at that point. Yeah. They, they need the police to be like, absolutely, yeah. come in, sit down, have a cup of tea. They need someone to put their arm around them and take care of them and to make them know that they're safe. Yeah. Because that's what the job's all about. One last thing, when it comes to non-binary people, because um, in the world, as usual, uh, in the world in general, there's a lot of men here, women there, in all factor of different things. Do you have any advice for any non-binary people who may be listening who wouldn't know which way to go? You mean whether they should go to the male or the female refuge? Yeah. Sadly, at the moment, there is a lot of work going on now. It's better, women's aid is starting to do work around issues and guidelines for refuges around non-binary. It's still not been finalised yet. And for most refuges, it's on a binary. It's You've got to make your pick. You've got to pick male or female, and that's the refuge for you. The only thing I can suggest is to pick the one that you feel you will be most comfortable in and go for that one. But when you are there in the refuge, you can say that your pronouns are they, them, or zizir. Your pronouns will be respected. I'm not going to say that there won't be occasions when they forget to use your pronouns. It does depend on where the refuge is and what, ex- how much experience they've had of non-binary. So there will be occasions when that happens. But hopefully they've been trained to just say, look, I'm really sorry, and leave it at that. Not go into long explanations of why they're stupid about it. That's, that's the worst. If you get someone's pronoun wrong, don't make it about yourself and how hard it is for you. Exactly. Oh, I've had that at parties before. It's the worst. Oh, so have I. We all have. But imagine that happening when you have gone to a refuge because of, well, circumstances forced you there and then had to have that happen. Yeah. And part of the abuse could be around your deciding to be non-binary. So mm. then when someone doesn't use it, it's like being re-abused. And that's why they need to use the pronouns that you ask and respect that. Because, you know, we're all people and maybe we all deserve respect. And, you know, crazy idea, I know. Um, Diana, thank you very much for joining us and coming in and, and sharing your experience and advice. I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to say thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to to let people know that whatever your situation that you're living, if you're living with abuse, I think you might be, that there is help out there and there is people that want to help you and there is places for you in refuge. You do not have to live in an abusive relationship just because you're trans. Yes, and whilst these exceptions in the Equality Act do exist, they appear to be, at least from where I'm sitting, barely used, if ever, and there are plenty of places out there that will put you up. Yeah, I've never come across it once. Which is interesting, considering all the fuss that's been made about it. But these are points we have covered earlier on in the episode. So, yeah, um, and I don't think I've said this enough, but Ipso, totally independent. Ipso, Absolutely. the most independent. <laughs> oh, I sound a bit Trumpy then. Oh, that's not good. Ugh. I mean, yeah. End it on a laugh. Yeah, I was going to say, let's, I'm uh, trying. Let's, let's put it. I'm trying my damnedest here. <laughs> let's put a pin in there. But then, I mean, also, you know, there is something, there is another sort of small cluster of people who we need to introduce and thank, aren't there? Oh, because yeah. Because... Yeah, this bit, remember, that we spent most of the week uh, dealing with. Because we have, as you may have noticed on our social media and on a couple of the episodes, we have put a call out for people to assist us with research. 
uh, to go through things, to maybe hunt things out for us, dig up some additional details. Anyway, so the first people that we've got on board are, so a big welcome to Cassie Wilde, Sophie Enyo, and Naomi Makin. Thanks to all three of you for the contributions that you made to this very episode that you are listening to right now. Yep, couldn't have done without you, team, and we're in charge of people now. I know, right? Go, go, trans research team. That's so, that's uh, so strange. I don't know what I'm I doing know. there. And you need to stop showing up to the Skypes with your fucking riding crop, Ashley. I, look, I <laughs> think it's important to establish discipline early, all right? Um, <laughs> and I think on that note, you can find us on social media, can't you, Michelle? Yeah, come to us on social media, that thing you do that ruins your day. Um, you can get us on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash what the trans. You can get us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash what the trans. And you can get us on Tumblr at what the trans pod dot tumblr dot com and also also we're gonna have a website we like are a real one. A website is a dot com a proper one indeed um which, which is in the works but is not ready yet so i wasn't gonna mention it so thanks michelle i'm gonna mention it because it's great it's awesome it is pretty cool and yeah we are delighted yeah uh we'll go into more details on that but very exciting times of what the trans because not only do we have an actual laptop and microphones we're going to have an actual website with an Woo-hoo! email address that isn't at gmail yeah that's that's going to be cool because it's got a z isn't it what the trans at gmail somebody took some what other, the trans with an s some really rude person took what the trans at gmail.com so if you happen to be listening to this i shake my fist at you i may even bite my thumb yeah do you know how embarrassing it is to call up like fucking foreign office or someone and be <laughs> like hey so here's our email for our totally legit outlet that's been reported in the metro <laughs> what the trans with a z do you know how embarrassing yes. that is uh i i mean i do yeah, because, you know, we do the same job here, honey. I was talking to the listener who stole our email address, Ashley. Oh, yes, yes. Th- I'm, I'm sorry. I Then I apologise for my impetuous interruption. <laughs> and I also think we should actually end the show as we plan to a couple of minutes. Yeah, let's end the show. Uh, so thank you to our lovely new research team. Thank you very much to Diana once again for popping along to join us this time. And thank you to you, the listener, for sticking with us. So stay safe, stay well, and we will speak to you in a couple of weeks. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everyone. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in today's show, then please do get in touch with the LGBT switchboard on 0300 3300630. Now, if you suspect that you are involved in an abusive relationship, then please do reach out for some help. You can go to Gallup, the LGBT anti-violence charity at Gallup. G-A-L-O-P dot org dot UK where you can chat online with someone who can give you some help or if you prefer you can phone they have a London specific number 020-7704-2040 or they have a national number 0800-999-5428. These numbers will appear on our reference sheet that we always link to in the description of this podcast. So just scroll down, give that a click and you will find all the information you need. Please do not hesitate to get in touch if you suspect that you may be in a spot of bother. Thank you for listening. 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 Thank you